Uh, thanks for uh, inviting me along this evening and also for giving me the opportunity to, uh, to talk on this matter. Um, as I understand it, the, the theme of the discussion this evening is around the services that the Colonial and Shared Education Skills and Children's Services Department offers uh, and particularly around uh, additional support needs and the, the broader needs of, of children and young people in their care. So for us in the, in the Corla, we operate a principle of inclusion uh, and we do so under the, the Scottish Government's ESN legislation. Uh, and for us, inclusion is about the default position as much as is possible for us is that young people, children and young people with different needs are able to receive their entitlement to education within their own catchment school. Uh, and for the vast majority of our young people, that is what is able to be uh, achieved. Uh, and we channel a significant amount of support to different communities around the islands to try and make sure that that happens. And that uh, allocation of support is based on the individual needs of children in schools at any time uh, and is review reviewed annually. Uh, the, we do operate as well as some additional enhanced provisions for severe and complex needs where children's needs are, are quite significant uh, and require some specialist intervention. They are within the footprint of existing schools. We don't operate any dedicated ESN support provisions. Uh, they are all in, in turn to schools and I'll talk about them a little bit further on. In terms of identifying and supporting additional support needs, we operate a staged intervention policy uh, and that involves various different professionals, both Cornell's own professionals, uh, like support for learning staff, uh, ASN staff, educational psychology, also working alongside partner agencies from particularly in the NHS Western Isles, but a, a, a whole suite of agencies where professionals will assess the needs of that child. And then they go into a four stage intervention process where the first level of intervention is that they have a, a low level additional support needs or potentially short term, that's stage one. Uh, where that child can follow the normal curriculum of the school, but requires some adjustment and adaptation by the teacher. The, the second level, the second stage of intervention is where there's a, a more significant degree of need, where the support might overall still be delivered by the teacher, but that there may be some adaptations to that person's curriculum or learning to recognize their own, their own needs. Then we move into staged intervention level three, which is where we're starting to get into more uh, complex needs and where the, the children require external support from other agencies uh, and that could be maybe a single agency or several different agencies involved in our services involved in supporting the young person as well as the school itself uh, and then the last stage is stage four which is mainly for children with severe and complex needs uh, and requiring significant degrees of intervention and usually following an entirely separate curriculum from, from the main curriculum of the school. So that, that's the sort of structure that determines the degree of need and the degree of support that young people can have. The support that we offer uh, varies quite significantly from school to school because it is calculated based on the needs of the pupils in that school at that time. Uh, and the support follows the pupil, not the school. So that, that's reviewed annually based on the cohort of pupils that are in the school at any time. Uh, and can be changed depending on movement of pupils between schools and also the developing and changing needs that young people can have. Our support obviously begins from teachers themselves and support staff themselves in schools, so support for learning assistance in schools themselves, but also can include uh, some of the services that I've already mentioned there in terms of corner services and partner agencies as well. I mentioned a little bit earlier on too that we have two enhanced provisions. These are settings within existing schools where there are additional resources, additional staff, additional training provided to meet complex needs for young people. Very often these needs can range from physical uh, health uh, and uh, developmental issues through to social, emotional and behavioural issues as well. The two enhanced provisions we operate are at the Nicholson Institute for secondary pupils and at Skolnaboch for, for primary age pupils in Lewis. There are um, obviously pupils with uh, in severe and complex needs in the Southern Isles as well, uh, but there are bespoke provisions for them in their own catchment schools. 
So Skolnavoch and the Nicholson should can sometimes have pupils that, particularly Skolnavoch, uh, can sometimes have pupils coming from out with their catchment to access that provision in, in that school. Uh, and as I've mentioned as well, we do work very closely. We work with Naomi, who's here tonight from Action for Children, who provide a lot of different support services for our young people, sometimes within the school day and around the school day, but also very importantly, around the child uh, and their life beyond the school. Uh, as I've mentioned, we work closely with our own services like educational psychology and support for learning and importantly, social work and children's services, but also with uh, the range of um, services from the likes of NHS Western Isles. So really in summary, our service is about trying to access whatever the young person needs at that time. And it's entirely uh, a needs-based assessed process. And then we have that duty to provide whatever resources that young person needs to, to allow them to access their education. So that's a, a quick summary of, of this kind of overall service that we provide in terms of ESN specifically. So we can take any questions on that or anything that anyone would like to, to ask. How many psychologists, educational psychologists, does the CNAS have, does the council have? Uh, the Corla has two uh, educational psychologists uh, working across the Western Isles. We have a principal education psychologist and a, a general education psychologist as well. And we sometimes contract in specific psychology services where maybe there's a specific need for a young person that, that isn't within our own resources. Ultimately, similarly to the likes of the NHS, as a Corla, we can't sometimes justify the full-time employment of a particular type of specialist just by the number of pupils that we have. So we sometimes work with other authorities, particularly across islands and islands in the north, to, to sometimes bring in additional services where we need it. Um, but yes, we are, in a short answer, we have two educational psychologists. Uh, I did receive a few email questions about this, uh, or, 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 or about this event tonight um, uh, from people who can't attend. Uh, scoring autism. Um, can you just give us a, a few indications of how it is that you score uh, uh, child X, pupil X, the parent wants them to be scored on the autism spectrum? Can you just talk us through a few of these? Absolutely, yeah, the, that, that's, that's a, an interesting process. Um, very often uh, where there's um, the possibility of an autistic spectrum condition being identified, and, and that, that's a, a whole suite of conditions. Autism, autism is a, an umbrella term as well for a, for a number of conditions that can sit within the autistic spectrum. Uh, sometimes these referrals come from parents, sometimes they can come from, from the doctor, from medical services, and quite often also they'll come from directly from school staff. Uh, we triage uh, a referral process within the Cornelia uh, and where anybody wishes to make a referral for an assessment like that, it's, it's triaged by the Cornelia. There's a specialist team that assesses for autism, a, a, a team that involves education psychologists and health professionals from NHS called the Social Communication Team. Uh, and referrals are made to the Social Communication Team who will then conduct a, a series of assessments visits, observations, interviews with the family to then evaluate uh, the, the evidence of the case and come to a decision about the diagnosis. So it's a collective process ultimately, and it's not one that the Corla undertakes on its own. It's one that's done by an, almost like a semi-independent team, the social communication team that's a, a mix of education and health professionals that look at the, the whole context of the case. And then uh, once they've gathered all that evidence together, they confirm the diagnosis. How, how early would uh, the Cornellan team, the education department team, intervene? Would it be in nursery or scholadia, as they call it now, or would it be uh, earlier or after these thresholds? What's the sort uh, in, of threshold time? In, in terms of autism specifically or, or generally about ASN in total? Oh, yeah, sorry, yeah, it's about ASN in general. And ASN in general, it's, it's at all stages. We, we do try and operate an early intervention model where uh, we now have um, increasing scholaric and nursery provision where the, the young people are in an education setting for a much longer period of time uh, as the government has funded um, 1140 hours of uh, childcare now for families. Children are able to be in nursery settings for much longer periods of time, which means there's more opportunity for observation of, of development needs. 
I would say probably other than things that I've specifically identified through the health visiting service and through early development, the first signs where we start to pick up uh, where there might be issues around learning uh, at, in, in the 27 to 30 month review that the health visitor does with the family uh, and where there are potential issues there, the health visitors pick them up or can refer them to us. Sometimes that can involve building up to early into early access to nursery. So we, we have potentially two year olds can sometimes come into nursery through that process. And we, we identify and work with and develop a, a assessment of additional support needs throughout the child's journey in, in school. Sometimes these needs can become very clear and very apparent and are unknown and identified from a very early age. Other times they can be slow to develop and you know, children are complex and sometimes things can be presented as other things uh, and gradually as they develop and understand uh, and the child situation changes, that assessment can come later. So it's, it's under constant uh, observation uh, and also equally sometimes the situation is that um, the children's needs change. So where the different assessments are, are taking place across the child's journey through school, it might highlight that there was a need that's decreased or there wasn't a need that situations have changed and the need has increased. So schools review children's needs at least annually, uh, depending on, on the nature of it. So it can be identified at any time, but we do try and do it as early as possible. Oh, well, thank you, Donald. Uh, mm -hmm. so that concludes uh, almost all. I have one more, which I'll ask you at the end. Uh, it's quite a general question. Uh, so thank you. And uh, we'll, move on to, yeah, we'll move on to Naomi. We were very pleased to have from Action for Children. Hi there. I'm going to uh, attempt to present the slides also. Are you able to see that and myself here? Fantastic. Okay, so I'm just, it's, this is just a real whistle stop tour of what we do here at Action for Children, Ellen Shear. Um, we cover all the way from the Bat to Barra now, because um, we've got projects in Houston Barra, but that's only the ADP funded services we've got in Euston Barra. So I'll really be focusing more on what we do in Lewis and Harris because we've got the majority of our projects there. Um, and again, with reference to the additional support needs services, that'll be the main chunk of this. So let's see if I can do this. Okay, so we have an outreach respite service and this provides um, an individualized package for young people with additional support needs. And the referrals come through the, the resource panel. So it's unfortunately not a service that families can self-refer to, um, but it, it is a service that's out there for families who are already identified or who are presenting um, with children with additional support needs and they need that bit more support outside of the nine to five, the school day, um, because we provide a bit of respite in the evenings and the weekends and throughout the school holidays. Um, and there's no one package, like two packages that are the same. Every package is individual to the young person, their needs, the family and, and the availability we have as well. Um, and it's based, our outreach respite is based in a resource centre in Bayhead and Stornoway. But as it, the name says, it's outreach. So actually, a lot of the time we're in the community with young people where we've been known to do little pieces in the home where it's been needed. Um, and we, we also work really closely with education and, and for some of our respite that takes place within school as well, it's, you know, outside of school times. Um, so I think I've covered that. Um, and some of the partners we work with. So in order to make sure that the service is holistic, we work um, with the child first of all, because they're at the centre, we look at their needs and we have um, various systems we use to work with the children towards outcomes. Um, and these can be things like life skills, it can be behavioural outcomes. Um, so we very much focus on the young person and their needs and work alongside their family, education. We mentioned earlier, educational psychology, occupational therapy, you know, the allied professionals, speech and language, physio. Um, we work quite closely with social work services and then health, the likes of the learning disability nurse, the school nursing team, the health visitors. Um, we also have a lot of young people who cross over with our project in Bayhead um, and our residential unit at Hillcrest, where we, I'll talk about that more in a minute. 
Um, and so we work closely with the healthcare staff in these instances as well. Um, we also work quite closely with local community centres, um, sports facilities like Sports Niche, with the sports centre in town with Activate, Ben and Harris. Uh, we work in the community with the young people to get them as engaged in their own areas as well. And we've got quite a good relationship with Amlanter, where we've done a number of pieces of work in partnership with the Amlanter there. Um, some of the facilities we have at Bayhead, unfortunately, I don't have a huge amount of photos I did, did when I could, but we've got a kitchen and quite regularly we do cooking and baking with the young people. Again, a bit of fun and a bit of life skills um, where they can prepare their own snacks and foods. We've got a multi-sensory room as well, which has recently had some new equipment we got through fundraising and that's, that's usually really enjoyed by the young people. We've got a, a smaller one-to-one, -one, um, very low stimulation kind of room. And this is used a lot by the, the allied professionals, by the speech and language occupational therapists, because it's not got much going on in it. And they, they can really focus with the young people um, in this, this quiet space. We've also got the, the large resource room, which you can see in the picture. And this can be split into two rooms. And that's quite a nice space. Uh, we do some of our group work in there with, with mums, which I'll go into later. Uh, and we've got a garden which was recently refurbed in partnership with the local ADP recovery services. Um, and it's got a wee picture of when Pete and Diesel were there to open it. <laughs> so that was quite enjoyable. Um, but that's some of what, what we've got in Bay Head. But we also, like I said, we go out into the community and we access a lot of play parks. We, we use facilities like the Bridge Centre, Sports Centres. Um, art centre, the young people love places like the museum um, and, and their own communities as well. So I mentioned earlier about Hillcrest. Um, Hillcrest is the residential children's home and in that it's got a separate respite wing um, and the respite wing has its own living room, it has a staff room and it has a young person's bedroom which actually has uh, electronic Bed. It has a, a specialist bed in it, which we got through um, to health. Um, we've got a, a bath as well that's specialised for young people. It's got a hoist and it's adaptable for young people um, with additional needs and disabilities. Um, and so the residential unit, again, this, this is through referral, through social work and through the, um, what's the word, the resource. <laughs> panel, sorry, uh, and that's where the packages are decided for here, but some people, uh, some of the children get small packages where they come in maybe for two nights at the weekend, and some children come in for a few nights through the week or for a week maybe in the, in the school holidays, um, but we, we're continually busy and there's a pretty much constant turnover throughout the week at the moment of young people coming in and using the, this resource. Uh, we've also provided emergency respite when they've been, you know, we've had parents having to go to hospital and, and the likes of them we've had been able to accommodate the young people for for short times in this emergency respite here as well um, so it, within this respite there's round the clock care we have waking night staff we have you know sleepover staff with monitors and all our staff are, are very highly trained in administering storing and, and handling medication and, and communication tools such as Makaton, PECS, using electronic devices, manual handling training, behaviour support training, and, and really just meeting the needs of the young people, depending on, on what, what there is. We've got staff, you know, um, especially trained in peg feeding as well. And, and there's always, we always make sure we've got the appropriate staff who are, are trained. Um, and, and no two weeks will be the same for each young person when they come in as well, that we always make sure there's a, a variety of activities on the go for their stay. And, and if they don't feel like doing much, they don't have to do much, but if they want to do things, we always make sure that's an option as well. Um, we've got, uh, outside of the additional support needs services uh, for respite, we've got quite a lot of other support services. So we have alcohol and drugs partnership funded services, um, all the way from pre-birth to, to 18. We've got the early years worker who works in vulnerable and pregnancy. She works um, with children all the way up from pre-birth to seven. And then there's myself, I do early intervention. So I work from eight years to 18 
supporting young people affected by another substance misuse or by their own or their own periphery of maybe risk taking offending behaviours as well. And we have a worker in Houston Barra who covers that whole age bracket um, under the, the Alcohol and Drugs Partnership funded post. And we have the weekend street work service, which we call the outreach. And within this, we also deliver some pop up groups and and, and things like that. But we, we go out every Friday and Saturday night and work in partnership with the police and with communities, um, just making sure young people are safe. We've got assessment and therapy service and they work close as a team of two at the moment. It'll be three soon and they work closely with your um, allied professionals, your OT, your physiotherapy, your speech and language. And they tend to be, for the majority, they tend to work within school settings. So they go into classrooms and they do very prescriptive work in partnership with the lead professional, um, with the young people and, and they work around, like so we've got had um, some children learning to ride a bike with our, our staff or they may work on some a particular part of the speech therapy or a particular part of the physiotherapy. And we actually in our they head services as well. They, they work in there and the other professionals come in and join with them. And we've got things like um, this, uh, suspended swing um, in the resource room and crash mats. So it can be quite an energetic session. Usually the staff come out pretty <laughs> exhausted. It's a very intensive but energetic session for the majority. Uh, we've got the Young People Service, which is funded by Violence Against Women, and this is a service for young people aged 8 to 18 who are um, affected by domestic abuse. Uh, and within this, we also do supervised contact packages for, for families who, who require this. Um, we've got the Blueprints, which is our newest project, and that's the Perinatal Infant Mental Health Project. Uh, they're just starting a group Soon, uh, where they get volunteer mums to support other mums in the first three years of the child's life. And it's, it's the aim of that is to improve the mental well-being of mums and their, their young infants. We've got, as I said, the residential unit. And the side I didn't talk about was our care experience side. So we have a four bed unit, um, which is, is funded in partnership with the local authority. And this is for uh, sort of longer term accommodated young people. Um, it's, it's very busy. Uh, we've got the fetal alcohol support, uh, the fetal alcohol syndrome um, support service as well, which is relatively new. And this is our worker who works with um, children and adults affected by fetal alcohol syndrome. As you see, it's quite a comprehensive package, and within that, there's so many other little bits. Such a soup work. So, as I mentioned before, within the ADP services, we've got youth groups, pop up activities, weekend outreach, and in the young people service, we actually run a, a fortnightly group in partnership with Women's Aid, Western Health Women's Aid as well, um, which is always a busy little group. We've got a number of parenting groups. So, we've got the Maternal Infant Nutrition Group. And that's at the moment we've got six mums and their babies attending every Thursday for a block of 12 weeks. Um, and some of these mums may self-refer or they may be identified through health or social work to come along. But for, for the majority, I think they actually ask to come along. And this is quite a nice group for mums who maybe feel isolated or may lack a little bit of confidence in going to some of these larger drop-in kind of pre-COVID groups. Um, and they do a, a bit of cooking and they sit and have a, a lunch together and we usually get speakers, guest speakers and to come and cover a topic with them. We've got the Blueprints group, which I mentioned, that's a new group. And the focus of that is volunteer mums and peer support for new, new parents. We've got Mellow Bumps and Mellow Parenting, which is an accredited programme which runs again over a number of weeks. And it's pretty prescriptive and supporting expectant mums and expectant uh, and the mellow dads as well which I haven't put in so dads who are new to the scene and they can learn some good positive kind of parenting skills and coping strategies and we've also got two staff qualified to deliver group triple p which is the um, psychology of positive parenting and that's a very prescriptive eight-week block of parenting support 
And then we've got Smashin and Smashin Buck, which Smashin is a group that runs once a month for young people um, with additional support needs. And Smashin Buck is the sister, the newest one. But we've kind of we found that previously we were supporting young people to attend from say the age of 12 to 30 and this wasn't always appropriate so we've made divided them so smashing buckets for your your older ones and then smashing for the, your your younger ones we've cut cut it kind of in half um, and then some of the additional provisions that we don't really advertise but we definitely do regularly um, we offer quite a lot of practical and financial support and where we don't have the packages to offer these we signpost and we work quite closely in partnership with the like of I mentioned earlier with uh, Citizens Advice, the TIG, um, we work quite closely with Salvation Army just trying to get resources practical and Food Bank as well, practical things for families um, and we support young people to participate and be involved in sort of local youth voice um, and, and service evaluations as well and we also provide the safe spaces at events like the Hib Kelp and the Dinner Dances. So I'm pretty sure I've missed quite a bit of what we do, but that's just a bit of a whistle stop tour of what we have. For the pre-birth programmes, how would somebody access the pre-birth classes that you run? The perinatal and infant mental health, that, that can be self-referral, or if you, you can speak to your health visitor, or to if you have a social worker, you can speak to them. But we also accept self-referrals for that service and also um, the alcohol and drugs partnership. So where there may have been a history of substance misuse or a current kind of concern somewhere within the family of substance misuse or alcohol, um, you can actually self-refer to these services as well. And it's discreet and it's confidential. And obviously, you know, if the concern needs to be escalated, that would be discussed with you as an individual. But for the majority, we find that the vulnerable in pregnancy or the, the prenatal ones come through maternity. It's maternity service, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, youth Voice, is that, uh, you just say a wee bit more about Youth Voice. Yes, yeah, so we, we, we have youth volunteers and as an organisation as well, we part of the policy makers and part of the policy change in Scotland, we sit quite closely alongside the Scottish government as an organisation. So whenever there's an opportunity for young people to get involved and have their voices heard, we always encourage that. Um, and, and we used to, we previously had like a pathways group and we were always encouraging them to let their views be known, let them be heard and listening to them and, and acting on it and showing that we're not just paying lip service to the listening side but actually actioning them and, and we do that continually throughout our service as well you know when we're working with young people we're not making their individual plans for them we're doing it with them and making sure that they can be part of that and that their voice is being heard and are contributing throughout um, and we're making sure that if they're not happy with something we're doing something about it um, I also support you know some young people within the LGBT community and making sure that they, they know they're being heard and supported. Uh, on the last uh, on one of the slides that you had again the youth voice and financial support yeah is that is the financial support a discrete service or is there any yeah. real? Very much so um, we've had a number of families that we've worked with and especially over COVID we got quite a lot of support through the Scottish Government where we were able to um, deliver some financial packages uh, it could be for some for some families it was that you know the structure of their home had to change and they needed an extra bed because another member of family was coming in and they couldn't afford that but they needed like so some of our respite uh, packages weren't delivered to the level that they had been previously. So the families may have taken in an additional family member to support, you know, in the initial lockdown, but they didn't have a bed. So we could provide funding to buy a bed or, you know, we could provide, we, we also have a Turner and Townsend grant, which runs for our service users, where they get 35 pounds per child every year towards school uniform. And that can be in addition to their free school clothing grant. It's just an extra boost for those who need it that we work with. Um, I mean, we always we get little we get little funds come in like that where we can support families 
Uh, sometimes it might be buying a buggy for a, a new mom and things. On the subject of school uniforms, um, just going to ask Donald a question. Well, can you say something about the grants that are available? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, the the Corla through um, work with uh, and grant additional funding from Scottish Government offer clothing grants for uh, all families who are eligible uh, for that based on, on, on income. Uh, everyone who is eligible for free school meals is also automatically eligible for uh, school clothing grants. But there are also some people who are eligible for clothing grants that are not eligible for free school meals. Uh, all the information we have on that is available on the Cornell website and it's all been now uh, moved online. So it's discreet and people don't have to sign up, put in application forms and paper and so on. Uh, you, can, you can get that information and, and submit applications online. We also work um, with DWP uh, locally as well, so that where people are coming into uh, local offices for that, uh, for various benefits and so on, that there are um, opportunities for DWP to promote eligibility for clothing grants and, and free school meals. The, the clothing grants are available as a single payment per year, but we also look at supporting hardship payments and additional payments where that might be um, a factor. The, we very much acknowledge as well that it's a difficult balance with um, clothing because uh, school uniform, because obviously it comes at sometimes a cost, but generally it's still very strongly supported because of its ability to um, kind of share the cost of, um, of, of clothing and, and not having to keep up with the various different kinds of fashions and, and various things that people have. And generally overall, it's still more affordable than, than non-uniform clothes. The other thing that, that we are working on is a, a, through a programme called Cost of the School Day, where we're trying to eradicate all charges as, associated with accessing education. Uh, and one of these is trying to, where, where there's a need for it to, we can't make all uniform uni, un, universally free, but where there are needs, we support them through either the, the clothing grant system or through uniform exchanges and working with parents and parent councils to identify where there's really good quality used uniform that's made available free. Uh, you might see in some schools, in quite a lot of our schools now, there's a clothes rail really, there of help yourself, discreet, grab, grab uniforms that you want. And that's not just the school jumpers or the, or the main part of the school uniform. Sometimes you pull the shirts, shoes, shorts, trousers, all these kinds of things that are available. Right. And, and that ties in with kind of the environmental message of recycling for some, but also means that we can make a freely available, good condition used um, secondhand uniform, which can help with the cost of that as well. But we would encourage anyone who feels that they should be eligible for clothing grants to seek that application and get that, that financial payment, which goes a long way towards covering the costs uh, of, of clothing. And of course, parents can use it for for any clothing needs that the young person may have, it might not be about a school jumper, it could be shoes or ski equipment, anything else like that as well. I would maybe come in on that first. Uh, as I think it was Naomi in, in, in your presentation mentioned about the, the Cornless um, resource panel. Where, where there's a, a young person with with support needs and it sounds obviously I can't comment on individual cases here but where, where there is that that need usually there's a, a team around that child that uh, involves everyone who's working within the school um, health action for children any other partners that are involved in supporting him uh, and requests can be made through that to go to the resources panel for res specific respite care uh, and Naomi has mentioned about the provisions that action for children make to to provide respite and we also have um, respite sometimes provided through council services as well. So there is respite there. It's, it's allocated based on, on the assessment of the need of the young person to, ac to access it and the other um, capabilities they have for, for that. There's uh, other provisions as well. For instance, in the summer this year, there was a, a, long, a long program of activity, a get into summer program that was funded by government to have activities running through the day. I don't know if the circumstance that person accessed uh, these programs, but we have been trying to make these programs as inclusive as possible so that when there's um, anyone with additional support needs, they have every right to go to these as much as any other child. Uh, and where we know, we know and can plan for them to be able to go, we can provide the additional staff and support to access that. 
but that, that, that really only runs in the summer. For the other school holiday periods, it would be working through uh, the young person's team around the child to make a referral to the resource panel who can then look at an assessment for respite where they are. Yeah. So the, the team should be meeting for every young person, the team should be meeting regularly. Uh, sometimes it depends on the young person, but they can meet as often as every couple of months. Sometimes at, le at least there should be a, re a review meeting at least once a year as a minimum. But sometimes, depending on the needs of the child, they would meet a lot more often than that. The, the school acts as what we call the named person service, uh, and the school is the, the, the overall responsible agency. So where there is a case for respite, the, the first point of contact could be to the school. If social work are involved, sometimes social work can be the point of contact. Uh, but if, if social work aren't involved, uh, the first thing I would do is contact the school uh, and ask for the name person service to, to have a team around the child and then to discuss respite there. And then whoever the, the, the lead professionals are for that young person can arrange for the assessment and make the, the, the case for the resource panel to make a decision on it. Uh, and so the school would be the answer to that, to contact the school. Uh, in the first instance. And the second thing with the, the summer programme, it's, it's, it's disappointing to hear it didn't reach completely, but there, there were um, sessions running for, for, for all children. So I think I'd have to check on, on the individual circumstances of why that didn't happen. Um, but there, there should have been access to, to provision. And if there wasn't this year, we need to make sure that there is in the future. Thank you so much. I think in addition as well, if you wanted to contact us about the smash in group this Saturday, you know, one Saturday a month, to get your, your child involved, you know, you can always contact us and see what the suitability is like and if they would enjoy it. So you, who do you write to or contact? Uh, you could just, yeah, phone us at Action for Children and store away and we can send you out any information you need. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I am getting emails, but um, it's too much to start uh, asking these questions just now from people who, are, uh, who knew this event was taking place. Uh, I'd like to thank Naomi uh, for doing the PowerPoint and that was an outstanding presentation. Very, very pleased. And Donald from the education department. Uh, again, uh, excellent presentation.